Welcome, everyone, to our Black Hat 2019 series of interviews. Of course, I'm very excited, as always, for all of our interviews, and we're going to be talking about all kinds of uh, packet analysis and AI and machine learning, mm -hmm. which is more than just a buzzword, mm -hmm. and we'll get into it. Uh, here to help me with that is Somatra Das. He's the CTO and co-founder of Blue Hexagon. Somatra, welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Good afternoon. Yes, nice to have you. So, um, I guess first start with those that aren't familiar with Blue Hexagon, mm -hmm. what problem are you trying to solve? So the problem we're trying to solve is detecting both known and unknown threats in real time. Mm -hmm. And we live and die by the motto that we need to detect things in a second. Anything after that is too late, it's moved around, you have to hunt for it. So whatever we do, we need to make sure we can do that in one second I gotcha. and give a real verdict. So that's how so we... So you're not storing a whole bunch of stuff no. and then analyzing it right, later, yes. right? As it comes in, exactly. you're yeah. analyzing yeah. it. And We're not hunting for it, yeah. Okay. <coughs> and how are you getting the, the packets uh, or traffic? Is it a span port? Yeah, it's span or tap port. Uh, and typically it's next to a, giga, you know, a packet broker, a firewall, a switch, mm -hmm. or a decryption device, whatever the customer has. But anywhere we can get a sense of the traffic. Well, that's where we sit. Okay, and full packet capture, full not packet just capture. NetFlow, right? Not you exactly. want full packet, full packet capture. capture. <coughs> Agreed. The network doesn't lie, so I like your approach already. Right. Uh, but now you can also do this in Amazon AWS as well? Exactly. We announced that recently. We've been mm -hmm. working with them on that feature for almost a year and how to architect it well because in the cloud, traffic scales up and down very quickly. It can go from 1 gig to 40 gig. Yes. And your, and your inspection has to scale the same way. Mm -hmm. uh, so we get a copy of the traffic, but what's interesting there is you can bring it up you know with a script you mm -hmm. know with a terraform or a cloud formation and it just scales up and down as the traffic goes up and down so it's very easy so to your buy. analysis is also done in the cloud exactly. for that to have that exactly. scalability exactly i see yeah. it's just awesome. it's just as if the appliance is deployed right next to your network yep. it's still a network whether it's there or here that's and that's anything within aws you mm -hmm. can you can get that traffic yep. exactly any instance and the customer <coughs> can decide if they want to choose uh, specific instances to mirror the traffic from that's awesome. Yeah, instead of having a packet broker, they can just choose, oh, I want these five instances or these 10 instances right. from these VPCs and just mirror them. That's fantastic. Yeah. That's really, uh, not many are going to that level of granularity exactly. in, in AWS. Exactly. That's refreshing to hear. Yeah, As more of us deploy mm -hmm. into the cloud, right? Yeah, I mean exactly. Everyone's marching in that direction. And that's what's very useful for our customers is that you ha they have on-prem, they start there, and this makes it consistent, the journey to the cloud. They have the same dashboard, same visibility, it doesn't matter if you're on-prem mm -hmm. or not, it's the same kind of detection. Before what's happening is you have big iron on on-prem, when you go to the cloud, you need to have these 10 different startups for every small thing. Now the, you know, the traffic makes it more consistent. It's the mm -hmm. common source of truth for everything we do. Now, when I first started looking in, uh, uh, into packets and understanding packet headers and, and payloads in like 1999, <laughs> um, I was like, this is awesome. Mm -hmm. And when we would have uh, all kinds of discussions and classes about what to look for, yeah. fast forward to today, you're looking at traffic in real right, time. Right, right. How do you decide what to look for and what to maybe flag as anonymous or, right. or uh, 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 malicious or not? Very good. Actually, I was I was at Carnegie Mellon in US CERT in around 99, 2000 time mm. frame. And we used to play with PCAPs and we used to make a model that will take six months to train and don't doesn't do anything really useful. Yeah. So we were yeah. trying machine. We were playing we with machine learning. We all went down those same paths, yeah. writing scripts, yeah, analyze exactly. PCAPs, right? Exactly. Yeah. So, it took yeah. A, yeah, so the issue was machine learning wasn't great back then. Yeah. And actually, th the company we have now, even three years ago, we couldn't have done it. Mm -hmm. I've, I've been at other big companies looking at deep learning for 10 years now. Before, it was a marketing fad. Yeah, yeah. Before, it used to really work. Right. And now, you have Siri and you have self-driving cars, so it does really work. Yep. Uh, and it was... It's been interesting to see how with more data, that's number one, and more compute power. So we used like, mm. you know, at least 30 to 40 GPUs, large machines in Amazon to train these models. You know, all the data comes is an S3. It's terabytes and terabytes of data. So we mm -hmm. couldn't, even when we started the company two years ago, it used to take us a few months to train a model. Now it's a few days. So it's because a you very can large get more, scale training. Yeah. More data at once to train the model. Exactly. And, yeah. the, and the model can also, deep the difference between deep learning and machine learning is, uh, the human doesn't introduce his preconceived notions mm -hmm. into what to look for. So imagine that you have a PCAP. We don't try to say, look for this flag or this, you know, sin bit set. Because we the user gave you some kind of input, exactly, right? Exactly. Yeah, You're doing it without user input. Exactly. We say yeah. this is bad. We just need to make sure the PCAP is bad. And we then we let the machine deep learning decide what to look for to best understand that band. Given millions of these things, mm -hmm. it can find counterintuitive things that maybe human didn't think about. Hey attackers are using these specific patterns, which maybe I didn't think about on my own, and I don't want to bias the machine into doing that. See, I love that approach, because I feel like that users pollute mm -hmm. the machine learning algorithms more so than they very help true. them. Very right? true. <laughs> so that's why we've taken humans, uh, the users, out of the 
feature engineering job and move mm-hmm. them to the labeling job. So th- we still need humans in the loop, but the only thing they're doing is telling us what's good and bad. They're not teaching us how to, uh, what to look at in the PCAP. So if you right. look at what happened in voice, uh, we used to have you know waveforms and translations of the waveforms, and then we used to decide, hey, look at this, look at the pitch and frequency. We used to try to bias the machine to look for those things and build rules around it. Right, and that's exactly what you're introducing is bias, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. And what happened now with deep learning is, well, let me just feed the time domain waveform of the speech, give it the translation in English words, and it's going to find out what in the waveform I need to look at to match the right to match the output. And that's why a lot of systems will ask you, was my answer accurate? Like yeah. you hear the all the series and yeah. the lecture. They're retraining. Yeah, they're, they're retraining, exactly. essentially, based on the user's input. And we do that too, you know, all, I mean, I know there's a lot of buzzwords in the industry. I have zero false positives, 100% detection. It's never, it's n- any statistical system will make mistakes. There's the a variance in there's vari- exactly, right, right. exactly, because it's probabilistic. That's why it works so well, mm-hmm. that it can find the unknown. So you have to give it, uh, you know, leeway to make some mistakes. The question is, how much mistakes do you make and what's the nature of those mistakes? Mm. With deep learning, because of the capacity of the model, they're really large. Uh, they take in a lot of data. They can find non-convex functions. So if the good and bad are very close to each other, it can find a weird boundary between them. Mm-hmm. It's able to minimize those mistakes. So we want to say, choose algorithms that will minimize the mistakes you can make given the same amount of data. Right. And, and that's what deep learning is good at. I, and so it's not like a robot that is you see in the movies that's mm-hmm. completely autonomous no. and thinking and having no. feelings on its <laughs> not on its own. I think that's when, when people that's think of AI and yeah. machine learning, that's what they think is happening. Uh, I think that's it AGI. Right, yeah. yes. <laughs> so the real, that's advanced uh, autonom- uh, artificial general intelligence where you not only classify, but then you reason about it and you then act on the reasoning. Right. That, I think people in robotics are working on those areas. Sure. It's going to take a while, too. Oh. And this is not that, for Ag- sure. Agreed. I think it's the first part of it. We've yeah. seen data on Star Trek, right? And we yeah, all yeah. think that that's what's you know behind <laughs> all yeah. our machine <laughs> learning yeah. algorithms yeah. and security. But it's really just allowing the mm-hmm. uh, computers to make smarter decisions yeah. for us, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. And do, and th- we've seen this in med- you know medical f- uh, the me- medical field as well. Mm-hmm. Computers are better at detecting glaucoma. They're better at finding tumors just because they've seen many more examples. Right. And they've learned to generalize. They're not biased by the examples only the, you know a human may have seen. They may have like seen, yes. Exactly, and that's the key thing we are trying to bring to this picture, because we're looking at ten years of threats. You know, we won't just see the threats those analysts have looked at in that organization. It's looked at enough of them to understand how malintent is expressed in code and packets. That's really what right. we're doing. And it's so it's not a distinct signature. Mm-hmm. It could be a set of different oh, yeah, behaviors and indicators, right? That millions you're of them. Flag yeah. oh, so in a computer can make a lot more decisions than a human exactly, can in, exactly. in that case, right? Yeah, exactly. It can, and it can find the right boundary. Like it, it can find, so for example, how do I, our eyes work? They, you know, they look at lines and circles and they can tell it's a face because they've composed them together. Mm-hmm. Deep learning works very much like that. They'll take these raw features like API calls and code sections and entropy and they'll figure out how they fit together and help you describe what is good and bad. So right. they infer what you know things that are counterintuitive that the attacker is ends up doing without actually meaning to do them, and it's finding those kinds of things that uh, are expressed in the code. I agree, and I think it's a fantastic point because when I interview those on the attacker side, mm-hmm. and they very closely emulate user and or mm-hmm. program mm-hmm. application mm-hmm. behavior right. to achieve a slightly different goal. Right, mm-hmm. I may impersonate a user, mm-hmm. do things they maybe normally do. At some point, the attacker is going to use whatever they have access to, mm-hmm. the credentials, the application, mm-hmm. to slightly step outside of the boundaries. Yep. As a human, I have a really tough time mm-hmm. looking through all a pile of data mm-hmm. to yep. say, well, that user normally accesses that share, but you know, yesterday right. they sent a whole bunch of data right, to right, that right. share. Or right. I mean, that's kind of a bad example, but, but there are even more subtle variances, mm-hmm. but deep learning can find those variances yeah. much better. Better, or at least better. give us a set of examples that exactly. a larger percent are actually an attacker. Yeah, and actually, it's a very good point. One of our customers tells us uh, the industry is focusing too much on tools that generate more data. I already have a data of 10 yeah. years I can't go through. Right. Now the tool generates more data for me to look at. I don't need that. I wanted to give an opinion. We, we want to be opinionated about what we mm-hmm. see and you know, you know, know, hold hold our feet to the fire saying, okay, we said this is bad. Now either, either we made a mistake or we are right. We can't just say, hey, it's sort of bad, I need to go and check it out, right? We don't want to do this lead gen for threat hunting. Mm-hmm. We want to make a real verdict, and that's what's missing in the industry. Right. And, and going towards not you know robotics and advanced general intelligence, but at least saying we do detection, and then we integrate with all our partners. We work with the big mi- endpoint vendors, with mm-hmm. firewalls, with, with NAC. So we try to make the existing controls better by informing them early. 
So then, right. so you get to the next part of actually remediating as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not like a robot is going and fixing things, but at least it's autonomous. It's automating the fixing of things by detecting early and understand and detecting well. Mm. What what's a typical deployment like? Do people have those aha moments the instant they turn it on and they mm -hmm. go? Oh my God, what's that? And people go running out of the room because it sounds like you would have that yeah. experience in what yeah, you described. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's very interesting because because we are not baselining. We don't say we're going to sit there for three weeks mm -hmm. and then we'll come back and tell you interesting stuff. So we say, oh, we came in. Either there's something going on right now. We'll see it right away, or you know, hey, let's take the thousand new things that came out today. All you know, dark web, virus total, and all these different repositories. Let's just take new things that came out today morning, and just download them into your enterprise and see what if any control will catch it, mm -hmm. and just let us look at it as well. And so that gives a very nice picture. Oh it's, 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 it's not yeah. made up, you know. Just get a thousand things in five minutes and see what you get. You know, maybe something will block half of, uh, you know, twenty percent. Something may block mm -hmm. five percent, and you get a good picture of how much is being missed. Mm. So it's a very clear ROI for the for the customer. That's uh, fantastic. That, yeah. Uh, tell me a little bit about your integrations. Are you integrating with things that are automatically blocking and remediating mm -hmm. as well? Yep. So actually, recently, just today morning, we announced our integration with Microsoft ATP Defender, mm -hmm. and that's a pretty—it's very prevalent. It's it, you know, it's in every Windows endpoint, for example, and in some and Mac as well now. Hmm. And what's interesting there is there's multiple kinds of integrations. We are in the network. We see things early. We'll also th see things that are never written to disk on the endpoint, mm -hmm. like wireless attack. But we'll see the code flying by on the network. Right. So any of those kinds of things, we can do things like if you see this hash, don't let it run, uh, or delete it from the endpoint, or even isolate the endpoint completely. Yep. You yep. could even say, you know, it's going to this IP. Don't let anything go to the IP. Mm -hmm. And all of this, many of these can be done very quickly. Some integrations take longer, maybe minutes, mm -hmm. but many can be done in a couple of seconds. So you really get end-to-end -end detect on an unknown sample coming through detection and remediation in uh, in seconds which has been which is sort of unheard of uh, at this moment yeah that's fantastic if people want to learn more uh where can how they get a trial or a demo or so we have multi so you know we we can send virtual machines or physical boxes we have a very in interesting cloud pov we put up a proxy in the cloud mm -hmm. connected to our appliance and you just point your browser there and surf the web surf we have a malware repository that's updated every single day mm -hmm. you can download and so you can use your own samples mm -hmm. so it gives you a way to try it out very quickly and then if you like it, deploy it in your premises or in your cloud, wherever you are, and just see how it works out. And it's very clear. It's not like you need to sit, sit for three weeks and see what happens. You can just try it right away the moment it comes right. in. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.